Excellent. Welcome. Uh, we're mid June now. Hope folks are doing well. Summertime weather means it's getting hot here in Texas. Uh, hopefully, the weather's tolerable where folks are at. We'll go ahead and hop on in. We've got some new modules to talk about. Community contributor Xenofex added two new modules targeting a vulnerability in popular form software V Bulletin. Via the git indexable content function, these modules can exploit an SQL injection to dump data from all vBulletin tables or just the user table data. Uh, or they, the, the other module will achieve remote code execution, no authentication required. Xenofx added a nice amount of detail in the module documentation if you're interested in these details of, of how these work and more about the vulnerability. Uh, appreciate the contribution there. Contributor Hoodie came through with a new pre-auth RCE module targeting WordPress instances that have the drag and drop multiple file upload plugin installed, any version prior to 1.3.4. Based on POC work by A. Martinsec, this module will bypass the file upload security filter by simply appending a percent character to a file name, which offers the potential for uploading a PHP shell and executing code on the server pre-authentication. Nice. And in the sense of the old movie serials that they used to show back in the day, our own Shelby Pace added another RCE module targeting Oracle's WebLogic server Java object deserialization. This new module sends a serialized bad, attrib bad attribute value exp exception object over the T3 protocol to a vulnerable WebLogic target, triggering method invoke by leveraging an extractor comparator, which results in arbitrary code execution no authentication required, good stuff. And we will have a demo of this. Our own William Boo added a new module aimed at Cisco UCS director versions prior to uh, versions prior to 6.7.4.0. For vulnerable targets, this module will bypass authentication and use directory traversals to leak the administrator's REST API key, using that key to execute a Clopia script containing an arbitrary root command. Another RCE, no authentication required. And community contributor Newman Turrell provided a new module targeting Linux KI toolset versions 6.01 and earlier. Vulnerable versions of this open source performance troubleshooting tool fail to validate or sanitize some Git parameters, parameter values, which this module exploits to achieve unauthenticated remote code execution. This is pretty fancy. And we will have a demo of this. And a few more modules to talk about. Our own Grant Wilcox added a new module targeting a vulnerability in how the Background Intelligent Transfer Service, or BITS, Windows service handles symbolic links, achieving privilege escalation on vulnerable Windows targets. There's a lot of good detail in the PR write-up too. So if you're interested in learning more about it, check out that PR. And we will have a demo of this. Uh, community contributor Red OXFF added a new module targeting QNAP devices running vulnerable versions of PhotoStation. This module exploits a local file inclusion vulnerability to download arbitrary files from a vulnerable target. Pretty slick. And C and Cali team added a new module capable of decrypting the stored passwords of XShell and XFTP. And their modules also support storing those decrypted values as loot, which is pretty neat. And we will have a demo of this. And there's other valuable work going on to talk about, of course. Contributor Tim Wright added support for Python and command payloads to the OSX local persistence module. Uh, our own WillVu updated framework to select a default payload for a module when it is used instead of when it is run. This allows the framework user to see the payload that will be used before executing the module, offering them an opportunity to configure or change it. <coughs> Uh, Will also updated our recent SaltStack module docs and references to add related Cisco Modeling Labs, CML, and Virtual Internet Routing Lab Personal Edition, the IRL-PE, <laughs> information. Uh, and our own Alan Foster added some controls to the screen share interface, allowing size and delay customizations, and to switch between controlling and non-controlling interface. It's pretty neat. We will have a demo of this. And rounding out our list here, Contributor Hoodie made a number of updates to the module formerly known as Enum XChat, including adding HexChat support, code cleanup, and documentation, among other things. So some nice work there. 
And some bug fixes. Always great to get some bug fixes. Squash them bugs. Community contributor Noraj updated the framework GemSpec dependencies to include IRB, ensuring that Metas sorry, that ensuring that MSF Console's IRB command will work as expected for all our framework installs. So I appreciate that. Our own Zero Steiner fixed an issue where tab completing an opt address range option, such as our host would erroneously append a slash character to the host address. Community contributor C and Cali team fixed a number of modules where the R port option was not an opt port object. Uh, first time contributor Red OXFF updated the framework WinRM login scanner code to format HTTP requests more correctly for what WinRM expects, which fixes some errors that the WinRM login module was reporting. Uh, great first time contribution there from, from Red OXFF. We appreciate that. And Red OXFF also updated Metasploit's HTTP client to correctly handle relative redirect URIs that start from the root. Very handy. And community contributor Nonsense added a fix to the memcached extractor module to ensure it returns all items, not just cold ones, when the target has least recently used enabled. And Ron Allen Foster fixed a bug where module description data can be lost when running RuboCop-A, uh, which is a good fix to have. So I appreciate all those bug fixes there. And as always, for details on recent framework activity, you can check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blogs posts at blog.rapid7.com. And we do appreciate all of y'all who help make Metasploit better through your contributions and time that you give to the project. So thank you for that. And we'll hop into some demos. Um, the first, first demo here is one for the XL and XFTP Credential gathering. All right. So this module comes from the CN Cali team and uses the work of HyperSign, credited in the PR and the module, to decrypt the passwords stored in the file. We can do this because the encryption key is generated from environmental values available to us. Uh, for more information, see HyperSign's write up on the GitHub linked in the module credits. And in this particular case, Brendan installed XL and XFTP on a Windows 10 X64 release 18.03 as a standard user. And he has a session set up and already saved some connection data to XL and XFTP. Run the, run the module, get both the username as well as the password in both plain text and encrypted. For XL, uh, Brendan did not store a password, so I only get the username and host address. In this case, it was loopback. Uh, we have a, a demo of the Windows Background Intelligence Transfer Service bits privilege escalation that uh, Grant created it's himself. Um, Grant, you on the line? Yeah. Um, so this vulnerability wasn't entirely created by myself. It was also created by uh, Clement. Let me see if I got his name here. Clement Labra, uh, also known as IT Man. Um, he was the one who originally authored this module. So if you just click play here. Um, the module actually supports a wide variety of targets all the way from Windows 7 to Windows 10. Unfortunately, we were only able to exploit it on Windows 10 purely because of the elevation technique that's used. You can still exploit it on other targets. It just won't um, elevate the privileges. So we're just going to load up and obtain a quick shell here. Keep in mind that to exploit this vulnerability, you will need to have a local shell on the system already. However, any shell will do so long as it's not within a sandbox. The way this basically works is that um, the, the bits uh, job on the old versions of Windows, they didn't properly apply impersonation. So what Clement found was basically that um, by creating certain symbolic links and pausing the file copy of a bit shop in optimum locations, you can essentially redirect where it's copying the file. And because the file copy doesn't implement appropriate um, impersonation, when it copies uh, one of the temporary files that it creates, when it creates a bit job, that file will actually be copied as the system user. So by creating symbolic links in the right time and place, you can essentially replace that temporary file with like a symbolic link to say, hey, let's copy 
something that we can control to uh, protect the directory that any system can access. Now, this part of the exploit is what works on every system. So the current exploit module will support every system that is vulnerable. What is more difficult, though, is the fact that we have to then find a way to take advantage of that to gain privilege escalation. In the case of Windows 10, we did this by essentially exploiting um, what's known as the uh, USO loader privilege escalation exploit, which is essentially a privilege escalation within the um, update service orchestrator service. And by overwriting the file in the C Windows System32 directory, we could um, gain privilege escalation by crafting a malicious DLL that when the service starts, it will load and run a system. So we should see in the output here that we've generated the malicious DLL, we're copying it over, and we're just waiting a few seconds for the bits job to run. Um, depending on the target environment, that can be very quick or it may take longer. And now we've got a uh, system, so I'm just gonna check that. Check that we've got the right info, so that's the same as the previous shell that we had where we couldn't privilege escalate. And we'll just do a quick little test with Kiwi to make sure that we're actually running a system and not just anything's going wrong. So yeah, you can see that works successfully. So yeah, hopefully in the future we will add support for more um, versions of Windows to the system at the moment. It's just tied into the Windows 10 and potentially Windows Server 2016, 2019, although this hasn't been confirmed yet, the privilege escalation shouldn't really work on those systems. Neat. Very cool module. Thanks for the demo, Grant. All right, and we'll move on with another WebLogic server deserialization remote code execution module from our own Shelby Pace. Shelby on the line. Yep. Fantastic. Now I'll get you going here. Bloop. Okay. Yeah, so uh, this exploit is actually a patch bypass for the exploit related, re related to the exploit that I demoed in our last demo meeting. Uh, so basically, it does the same thing. It sends a serialized uh, bad attribute uh, value exp exception uh, to WebLogic over T3 and uh, gets code execution unauthenticated. Uh, the difference here is that the uh, the gadget chain uh, has a few differences. Um, so basically, in the patch, um, the reflection, the call to extract that we previously used in the previous uh, exploit was taken out, but uh, it was actually the wrong call to extract. So basically, the uh, the gadget just uses a few more um, uh, classes to to get around that to to then uh, execute code, basically. And there you get a session. And yep. Uh, any questions? I'm I'm curious how many more of these we might <laughs> are there more of these to expect to come. Um, I I've actually seen a few uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, so there are yeah, quite okay. a few more. Um, but okay. I haven't touched them yet. <laughs> right on, right on. No, cool. I was just just curious. I, I love them. These are these are great, fantastic. Thank you, Shelby. All right, and uh, the Linux Ki toolset remote code execution. We've got a demo from uh, Mr. De La Fuente. Are you on the line, Christoph? Yes, sir. Fantastic. I'll start you up here. Yeah, please. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So the Linux KI uh, toolset from uh, Ulet Packard Enterprise, um, it's a, a trace-based performance analysis tool, um, which is used to troubleshoot performance issues on Linux. Uh, it anal uh, analyzes the kernel trace data and outputs a detailed report um, that helps to find root cause of uh, performance issues. So Linux KI also has uh, the ability to produce an, an answered uh, visualization charts and graphs. Um, for this, uh, it has to be hosted on a web server with PHP. So the PHP files are included with a Linux KI installation package. 
And one of these files, the kilis.php file, is vulnerable to remote code execution. Um, this is due to an improper input validation of the PID HTTP GET parameter. So the attack uh, consists in uh, concatenating a semicolon followed by the command you want to execute. So it's very straightforward um, um, command um, injection. All right, so uh, as we can see, we have uh, multiple targets available. So you can use different kinds of payloads, PHP, you can run commands, or you can have a dropper and run a native binary. Um, so we're gonna use the target number three to get a metabrator payload, uh, a reverse metabrator payload, sorry. Um, and we're gonna set all the options. So the remote host, the remote port, and then the payload option, the local host, I'm a bit slow to, to type. <laughs> uh, and yeah, let's use the verbums mode and that's it. So this uh, module has also a check method that sends an, an echo command with a random, a random string. So um, if the server reply replies with the same random string, it means it's a vulnerable. Uh, it, it confirms the code has been executed. So I'm going to run a, a T-Shark um, um, packet sniffer on the targets just to see what's going on. So as we can see, we have the PID parameter with a semicolon, which is URL encoded here, and the echo command with the random string. All right, so let's run it now. Here we go. So the metapreda session is open. It takes a bit of time, sorry about that. Um, we're gonna see the, the actual payload sent in this uh, PID parameter. Um, yep, here we go. So it's, it's not very easy to read because it's all encoded, but the payload is here, <laughs> believe me. All right, so we have our metapreda session. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. That's super cool. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you. All right. And uh, we see some of these new multi-managed screen share controls uh, that, that I've been hearing so much about uh, from Alan. Alan, you on the line? Uh, yep. Uh, so yeah, this adds controls to the post multi-managed screen share uh, post module. Uh, and in this demo, I've already got a interpreter session open to a Windows target running on a VM. Uh, and what this module will do is open up a web server, uh, which you can then visit in your browser, uh, in this case, Firefox. Um, and the problem I had whenever using this module originally was the screen was bigger than my laptop screen, the targets machine. Um, so you can just resize it. And by default, it was already controlling the target, which is a bit hard to use. So I've added a toggle for that. And then also there is a image delay as well. So you can configure how often you want to make uh, requests out to refresh the, um, uh, the, the screen session. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes it a little bit more usable if you would use it. That looks really slick. Uh, I dig it. Any, any questions for, for Alan on this one? I think people's mute is covering up the fact that we're all cracking up. Nice job. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Cheers. Wow. All right. Let's talk about the Attacker KB, the Attacker Knowledge Base, Hacker Data at Community Scale. It's a great place where you can read about bones and leave your opinion on bones, why they're cool or not, or valuable or not. Uh, we have a few demos today from the, the team that brings you Attacker KB. Uh, we'll start with Aaron is going to demo some API documentation improvements. Okay, um, so I'm going to start out by documenting some of the improvements to the public-facing Attacker KB public API documentation. 
as you can see at the top of my screen, I'm actually on the hosted version of the AKB docs. And uh, the first improvement you'll probably notice is that we've got some better formatting here on the um, on the parameters, uh, specifically the sort parameter down at the bottom. Uh, we have the ability to sort by several different attributes and it's just a little bit nicer now. We've got some markdown formatting here to help you uh, figure out how to structure your sort query. Um, and in addition to this, there have been some improvements to the try it out feature. Uh, so I should have grabbed an API key ahead of time. Let me do, let me do that real quick. Hopefully this is the right one. If not, you'll just have to pretend that it works. But uh, the, the point is that uh, when you hit try it out, you get all these pre-populated attributes that you typically have to clear out um, before you try to execute a request. We now have a clear defaults button up at the top. And if you click that button, all of these fields get blanked out and you can just search by one attribute such as this, hit execute and then you get your 200 response back. Um, so these updates should work for any of the models under the endpoints. Um, we've got formatting on all of them, updated attributes on all of them. So hopefully that's helpful to anybody who wants to utilize our uh, public API. We'll move along to Mr. Kino with the CVE state edition and search filter demo. So you should see the API docs on mm -hmm. the live API site. So I, uh, we, we added was the CV state. So our, our bots that process data and bring in updated CV information are now also bringing in the CV state. And you'll, you can see that uh, in the API in the response under the metadata object will now have a CV state field. It contains either public or reserved. Uh, we were currently bringing, we were bringing in public only. Uh, we've modified that to bring in reserved uh, CVEs. Uh, there was a desire to bring, make that data available, possibly in situations where the, the CV wasn't set as public, so it didn't exist in our system and or had a reserved sort of uh, placeholder uh, document. This would allow people to update those sort of in advance and get them in AKB so that people could start assessing those. Um, you'll see here's an example of a public one. Here's an example of a reserved. And it also just has that sort of blanket uh, placeholder value. Don't currently have any, so I can't really demonstrate it in uh, the AKB interface. Uh, but I will just show a quick look at how the filter operates. If we come into the search, I ran the search with no uh, search term. So I'm basically looking at everything I filtered down to tw year 2020. We can see there's a total of 13, a little over 13,000 entries when we're set to any state. If I were to click here to view the reserved, it's going to apply the reserve filter and any topics that have a CV state of reserved will be will appear here. You can see we have seven, uh, a little over that, so 7,000, almost 8,000 uh, reserved. You can flip back to public and look at all the public entries. And there you go. Um, right, the, the advantage of this one is just having that information, having more entries in our, in our uh, data store. I think sometimes there's questions like why something doesn't appear in AKB. And sometimes that's just because CV, there's a CV entry created that's reserved, but it hasn't been updated with that data. So the advantage here is we're now uh, tracking that. So if there's a discussion about uh, a current, uh, a new CVE, that you're able to at least find it in uh, Tech AKB. That's all. Any questions? So is that pulling all the uh, reserve ranges from the CBE list? Yeah, we've processed everything. Uh, we did it last week or the week before. So we've reprocessed all the data and brought in all uh, existing reserves. So we can even you know go back to 2000 if we want. Yeah, there was about nice. 27,000 reserved that were added across the corpus. Oh, that's awesome. Nice job. 
James flavor of relative date filters for the API. So this was a user requested feature. Um, I think Bob Rudis is actually the one who initially requested it, but um, some other people uh, in the public AKB Slack also requested it. Um, it's pretty simple. Basically, um, now there are two additional filters for uh, both the created at created date and the revision date for topics, uh, assessments, and contributors. It's uh, created after and be created before. So this just lets you put in a date and it'll return all of the topics or contributors or assessments that were created after that date or before that date. Um, it's kind of hard to show like with it, since I don't have like an exact count of how many there are, but you can see everything here as a created date after 615, which is my uh, parameter that I put in here. Um, and if I put in a date of 616, you'll see that nothing gets returned because nothing has been created after that date yet. Um, so that's today. So um, this right now it only supports uh, dates and not times, and it it only supports after. So if you want to see stuff for today, you have to go one day back. Um, it's it's not an on or after; it's just after. Um, and we also have it for before too. And uh, going forward, well, you know, anywhere we have a date attribute, we should we will also try to include these filters. Um, so uh, they'll be available for use from the API, and this will be really nice because. If you, you can just keep track of that date locally or less, like if you have a script that tries to pull everything daily or something like that from, from attacker KB, you could, you can just set this from the date. Now you don't have to manually parse and see, um, you know, what the last set of data was. So any questions? Um, what is that time based on? Is that going to be based on UTC or is it based on your current, your current location? It is based on UTC, which is what every, it's based on the value in the record, which is all UTC. Um, it's just matching against this attribute right here, which is set from UTC. Excellent.